well, that's great. So we've got half an hour. Um, and I guess William and I have been chatting a little bit because I met him at the UFO Science and Consciousness Conference in South Africa. And um, he gave such an amazing talk um, on epigenetics and his field. And um, Jaime and I, William, have been just, I've just started sharing some of my work because I'm trying to um, merge some of what I've learned um, at the school, at RSE, um, into my field, which is drama therapy and sort of um, all action and experiential methodology. So I'm finding different ways to, to look at how, what is the science um, and how can we bring it in. So I just thought it would be quite fun to have a conference call and just share, you know, just share what, what you do, what I do. I've got a few questions and who knows what could come out of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure very interesting <laughs> uh, topics uh, that will undoubtedly come out of it. <laughs> yeah, I agree. So, William, do you want to just introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, well, you know, it's great to meet you, uh, I'm in now, uh, or e even over Skype. Um, but um, I, I work for the uh, Resonance Project Foundation, uh, as well as uh, the Hawaii Institute for Unified Physics, or uh, high up the ORG. Um, and uh, I, I'm essentially what is termed a quantum resonance biophysicist. Uh, so I, I, um, I, I have a, a great depth of background in the cellular and molecular biology of uh, living systems. And I'm merging that with uh, um, the most recent theories in quantum physics, as well as um, uh, uh, cosmological holography, uh, geometrodynamics. So uh, um, unified physics and, and resonance-based physics, which is all looking at uh, uh, frequencies, uh, field interactions, and um, so, so you know, I, I'm applying that to like bioelectromagnetic effects, field effects, uh, and, and really kind of the mechanisms of how that works in the, the biological system. And, and you know, that that uh, is the foundation of that is things like. Uh, the non-local transmission of information. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of the, the scientific way of saying that, you know, we are all, all connected. <laughs> that, that, is a, that is fascinating work, uh, William. Uh, you could say uh, that what I I'm uh, interested in uh, my work, you know, relating uh, with the magazine, and I'm also part of uh, uh, Run the School as Amanda. Is uh, we're interested in human potential, and we're interested in all the things that uh, that you and Amanda are uh, bringing to your fields, you know, to your professional fields, because you are like the laboratory, you know, that is actually putting it into practice. You know, all these new ideas coming up. Uh, from your field, from the field of psychology, and uh, and this human potential that we all have, and that uh, quantum physics, you know, has been sort of uh, unveiling for us the, the power inherent uh, in us to change and to affect reality through frequency and thought. So that, that's more or less where I come in the picture. Oh, excellent, excellent. Uh, um. Um, Jaime, William and I was just, were just having a really interesting conversation which we didn't really have, have the chance to get into around um, HIV, which is obviously a big concern in South Africa, 
and, um, and frequency and epigenetics and how that all fits together. Um, and I wondered if we could just chat about that for a little bit, because I do a lot of work with HIV um, in South Africa, and I think we even spoke about it in our first interview. That is correct, yes, and I was very interested in that too. So it would be quite fun to hear, you know, how, w what William has to say about it and how the work that I've been doing with helping people to shift their focus towards what it is they want and how that might shift the frequency and how that all fits together with the disease. So, William, do you want to say what, what you were sharing about it, what, what research is being done? Yeah, sure. Um, so, we have to do <laughs> uh, So, um, there is this kind of a, a pivotal researcher who has kind of uh, blazed the trail, so to speak, into this uh, uh, kind of new understanding of not only uh, HIV, but actually uh, viral and microorganism pathogenesis uh, in general. So, so how uh, those, you know, very small uh, uh, my, microorganisms, which are on the nanometer scale, how they actually uh, are transmitted and infect individuals, and how they actually progress into uh, the disease state. And um, it, it's really what his research has shown. Uh, and his name is uh, uh, Luc Montaigne. Uh, he's uh, a French researcher. Uh, although, because of the controversy of his work, he's basically been excluded from the European research uh, institutions, and he's now moving to uh, China actually to continue his research. Um, it, 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 but he's actually a Nobel Prize winning scientist uh, because he actually uh, discovered that HIV was the causative agent of AIDS, most likely. Uh, and he won a Nobel Prize for that work. Uh, so he, he's a very famous and well-established scientist. But uh, what he showed was that certain microorganisms, namely anyone that he tested, uh, actually has a corresponding key electromagnetic frequency, a signature electromagnetic frequency. Um, a uh, kind of a, a, a oscillation pattern within the electromagnetic spectrum that they're vibrating at specifically. Um, and so what he has been able to show is that not only can these uh, microorganisms including uh, uh, microplasmids, which are extremely small microorganisms, and the HIV virus specifically, they can be reconstituted uh, as far as their molecular structure goes, like their, their DNA sequence, uh, et cetera. Uh, well, even their uh, uh, antigenicity, that is, the, the uh, uh, pathogenic potential, uh, it can be reconstituted by their signature electromagnetic frequency. Th this has been likened to teleportation because it's almost as if uh, you have the physical, let's say, virus, like the HIV virus, uh, in one location, it can 
literally be transmitted to another location almost by non-physical means. Basically, it can be transmitted just via that signature electromagnetic frequency and reconstituted in another location uh, without the more uh, physical vectors, the more classical vectors of transmission that we're familiar with. Um, so, uh, not only are, are these very small pathogens being transmitted in a non-classical way, that this is really, basically, it's a, a quantum mechanical transmission. Uh, it's the same kind of behavior that is observed in uh, quanta or, or um, particles that are displaying those kind of uh, more exotic uh, characteristics of quantum mechanical processes, such as uh, non-locality, superposition, um, entanglement, etc. Uh, it is basically that these uh, molecular systems, these microorganisms, they're so small that they can behave very much like a single uh, uh, quanta, um, you know, to exist as a wave and as a particle simultaneously, in a sense. Um, and so, uh, not, not only can they be transmitted just as a, a frequency, but they can also exist within the body as a frequency. And uh, this is problematic in terms of treating the disease or the pathogen. Uh, and, and this is well known with these types of uh, uh, microorganisms, these pathogens, these microorganisms, uh, because it's extremely difficult to treat mycoplasmas uh, and as well as uh, HIV. And the reason is, is because um, we have these classical based therapeutics, therapies, that are very physically based. Uh, you know, there are molecules that are targeting other molecules to try to uh, inhibit the proliferation of these microorganisms in the body. But the problem is, is that uh, you can target them through these classical or physical means, but they also exist within the body as uh, their electromagnetic signature frequencies, which aren't going to be targeted by drugs. So and, can, uh, can I just jump in there for a second? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's interesting because, um, you know, one of the things that I've been working on is, you know, this understanding of this link between thought and thought and frequency and consciousness and matter and how that all fits together and how, you know, how can I take what I've learned, basically, and, and try and apply it in, in my field, which is through drama therapy and kind of groups and interactive groups and stuff like that. And I've been doing a lot of work with um, groups with HIV. And I was just saying to Jaime in the last conversation that we had that um, as soon as you get someone who's HIV positive and you ask, you start to ask them where they're at and where they'd like to be at, and you start to move their, their, their mind, essentially, towards something that they would like. There has, to be, um, there has to be a frequency shift in that, and I don't even know, you know, really, essentially, how to explain how thought has frequency, but, I mean, that would be quite interesting, maybe, if you wanted to comment on that, like, 
how is thought broken into different frequencies and how is it that if you shift your thought from one place to a more um, expanded or more motivated space, something that you'd like to be living for, how, how does that shift the resonance and, and could that break that frequency signature of, of the HIV viruses could have, um, what do you call it, environment in which they're comfortable to live in. Because, you know, the results of that work, just helping groups shift towards what they want to live for, seems yeah. to make a huge difference to their immune system. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, uh, there's a, a direct link. And um, this is where, you know, it, it's... I think this is where it becomes very applicable, uh, especially t in terms of what we can do um, to affect these processes directly, uh, because uh, thoughts are frequencies. Uh, th thoughts are electromagnetic frequencies. If you look at how they're received, and transmitted through the body, it's all as uh, electromagnetic frequencies. Um, and that's where uh, there's a direct interface between uh, these microorganisms as electromagnetic frequencies, fundamentally, and our uh, resonant state, our overall resonance, which can be thought of as um, the sum of our uh, thoughts, emotions, and uh, our overall health, uh, which are kind of all inextricably intertwined. Um, so uh, when you have literally a uh, higher frequency, higher vibrational thoughts and emotions, that, that's literal. They're, they're literally higher frequency. They, they vibrate at a higher frequency. Uh, you're, you so, would be... So, William, sorry, would, would, would you measure a higher frequency through measuring the kind of excitement of the thought or the, the state, yeah, absolutely. The state yeah. that that person gets into? That would, I mean, I'm not a scientist, but like boiling water goes into a higher state, so that would be yeah. like excited, an excited state of mind type thing would, would read as a higher frequency thought. Exactly, that kind exactly. Of thing. So, um, so the uh, um, thoughts are translated by the body physically as emotions such as feeling joy, excitement, exuberance. And, and, and it's just that, that analogy you offered is perfect because it's just like a pot of water. If you put in high frequencies into that pot of water, eventually it's going to start to boil. And, uh, and the analogy really goes all the way. If you have microorganisms or pathogens in that boiling water, they're not going to be around for very long. <laughs> they, uh, they, they can't survive in that high frequency environment because they're, they're based at a lower frequency. Uh, it, it, that's the environment in which they live. Um, <clears throat> whereas if you take that same boiling pot of water and you cool it down continuously, uh, eventually it gets to a point where it will come to be inhabited by microorganisms. Uh, and, and this is, you, you know, true of the body. So, you know, as uh, our uh, psycho-emotional state gets to, uh, to such a low vibration, a vibratory resonance, it, it almost attracts in pathogens. And, and you open up uh, reservoirs within the body, uh, environments that they um, 
I actually seek out and can live within. And, and so there's a, almost a direct link there between um, a, a person's overall attitude, really, and their susceptibility uh, to diseases or the, their ability to overcome these diseases. Uh, be, because even if you were to be infected with HIV, uh, you can um, boost your state th through the practices that you were describing. One can increase their vibratory frequency such that uh, they can practically live unaffected by that uh, the presence of that virus. And you know th this has been shown. It's well known, in fact. So, um, Jaime, did you want to jump in there at all? Or? Yeah, yeah. I, I would like to ask uh, William um, uh, about uh, thought and frequency. Um, have you guys done any experiments uh, to show is frequency more of a carrier of thought? You know, is is the observer effect uh, uh, or, or the observation present uh, when a certain frequency is being applied or utilized? Does the observer uh, have an impact on the frequency, or the frequency has uh, its ability to impact always the same way, or, or is it a carrier, or does the frequency itself have the the, the value of how it's going to to affect the environment? Um, th there's been a lot of uh, uh, circumstantial testing of that um, in that uh, you know there, there's been shown experimentally uh, correlates between changing the frequency of the environment in which a person is in through technological means so so you can literally uh, set up devices that actually put the person into a very coherent and um, high frequency electromagnetic field. And, uh, you, you know, these are oftentimes fields that are, are a lot more subtle than each what our physical instruments can directly measure. Uh, the, 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 these fields are largely outside of the measurable electromagnetic spectrum. That's why some people refer to them in, in various ways, even as uh, scalar fields or information fields. Uh, but the, the, fundamentally, everything is light. It's electromagnetic frequency, uh, whether you want to call it scalar or information fields, etc. Uh, but you know, our information field is very apropos. But um, and I think this is kind of what what you were asking. But when an individual is in these kind of harmonic, coherent fields, harmonic resonant fields. Uh, there will be a measurable increase in the um, uh, mood where they, they will begin to feel more relaxed, more peaceful, more joyful. And that is a, a direct result of thoughts of well-being, positive thoughts, and overall increase in the attitude uh, towards a more a higher frequency and a more coherent and harmonic uh, 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 electromagnetic oscillatory field. So you know that has been shown kind of through, through uh, you know circumstantially 
through direct evidence, uh, 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 experimentation. But so, um, you, you were asking, uh, is the electromagnetic frequency a carrier of the thoughts? Is, is that what you're right. Talking? Right, right. Is it more of a, is the frequency, the different frequencies utilized, uh, are the frequencies themselves the ones making the impact on their own without any input from, the, from an observer? Or can a specific frequency be utilized as a carrier and the observer, you know, utilizing them, say the therapist? Uh, like Amanda, uh, be the one, uh, you know, channeling uh, certain uh, the uh, input into that frequency. Uh, oh, no, it, it, it's really, it's more that, so, uh, say, say Amanda as a therapist, uh, she would be acting as that technological device. Uh, it, uh, it's just that, uh, actually, I believe the, the human body is kind of the epitome of the uh, technological capability to do this. Uh, I, I think that our technology can can mimic what the body can do to a certain extent, but I think the person is even more potent and efficient in the ability to affect the field in this way. And so, uh, what it would be more akin to is that a man through her own vibratory frequency, she can set up an environment uh, in which uh, she's interacting or even entangled with the other individual. Their biofields are, are interacting, uh, intercommunicating when they're in close proximity to each other. Uh, it can even be done non-locally because it's a quantum entanglement. But uh, she would be setting up that harmonic resonance, that, that coherent field, electromagnetic field, that increases the patient's ability to actually um, attune their own body to that field. And so it's the same way that the, the technological apparatuses work. Uh, it's really that the person is matching their resonance, well, they're matching their vibration through resonance to that higher vibration being established by uh, either, say, the therapist or, um, you, you know, the... the um, health worker or the, uh, 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 even a technological device. Or even, um, even you know, if, because I work a lot with the idea of people creating their dream boards or vision boards, etc. And that future, essentially it's like creating that future self, you know, a dream that becomes the facilitator. So I'm just, I'm just there to facilitate them, helping to find out how to get to that dream. But that yeah. dream, their own choice of what it is that they want, would become essentially the the the, the resonant field. But but, but see, so, something about that, if I could just add real quickly, uh, is that it doesn't create, uh, it doesn't require that much work, because they don't actually have to create that future self. It's already there. All they have to do is imagine the qualities of that future self which will create that bridge, that link to the future self that's already there. And then uh, it begins the direct communication with that future self because the thoughts are being transmitted even from the future self to the present self <laughs> through those frequencies. And so it's, um, you know, it, it becomes an attractor. Uh, so it, it's just um, another way to look at that practice also. Right, it's interesting. Yeah. 
Really interesting. And it's also, you know, how to create the basic understanding for people that, that you know, their thought is actually creating or, you know, attracting or, you know, um, making up a, creating a resonant field for themselves in, in which they're living. You know, how do you, how do you even start with the basics of that for people? It's interesting. It's an interesting, you know, experiment, ongoing experiment, doing it for myself as well. You know, how am I able to create that and step into it and be it and, you know, it, well, and um, I can even kind of offer another perspective on that, if I may. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's actually, though, we kind of have a natural um, signature frequency ourselves. Um, and this is th this. Uh, natural signature frequency is actually kind of, uh, it's in resonance with what is translated by the physical body as our highest joy, our highest excite excitement and exuberance. Naturally, we're, we're naturally like that. Um, so actually, things that are in resonance with that are naturally drawn towards us uh, under a natural condition, a natural state. We wouldn't have to do anything. It would be as simple as breathing for these resonant matches to be attracted towards us and into our, our field. And the resonant match would be other things that are, are in harmonic resonance and match our highest excitement, joy, and exuberance. But what ends up happening is that uh, through cultural and environmental conditioning, I think we end up holding on to frequencies that are not natural for us. We have thoughts and beliefs they are not actually harmonic resonant matches with our core natural frequency. And we hold on to these uh, because for various reasons, I mean, partly through inculcation. So it's what our parents believe. It's what the people in our society believe. And so it's what we hold on to and believe for various reasons. <clears throat> so, so it, it's it's a lot. A lot has to do with resonance. Uh, as I'm hearing you yeah. explain this. Um, so, have you done like actual uh, experiments where it shows, uh, for example, a person uh, entering uh, one of these states? Say, say, so these these states that match a specific frequency, like say a state of exuberance that you mentioned. Uh, have you measured that? Uh, when someone is in that state, it produces a specific frequency that uh, that then has this healing effect, for example? Um, well, not directly, because uh, these frequencies are what, what we call subtle, subtle frequencies. And, and that's somewhat of a misnomer. They're subtle in the at this time, we can't directly measure them. We, we can't directly measure them in the same way that we can measure like the electromagnetic frequencies produced from the uh, uh, brain activity, that the uh, uh, um, physical uh, electrochemical transmission of the neurons, you, you know, that, that creates uh, um, an electric field that can be measured outside of the body, and it's correlated with this as well. Uh, uh, but th these frequencies are, at this time, too subtle to be measured directly uh, right. by our, our physical instruments, because uh, the types of 
physical arrangements that can measure them are almost proprietary, so to speak, to the biological system. And what the, so the, the biological system is receiving and transmitting or transducing these frequencies. And if you look at the molecular biology of that system, it's these highly fractal, holographic, geometric uh, structures of the living biological system that are able, and, and they're quantum mechanical through and through. Uh, it's, it's fascinating what you mentioned, you yeah. know, that, that the, in the HIV case, you know, that the, it's so, so minute that it almost behaves like one of these particle wave uh, uh, photons or, or quanta. Yeah. So, so you need a whole different technique than to approach them, uh, a whole different approach of medicine, you know, to approach this thing. Uh, if you can find a uh, interfering frequency, uh, 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 interfering frequency that it's going to have uh, 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 destructive interference, then you can cancel them out, <laughs> or at least block the transmission. Right. Wow. So that's that's where that's where you know I'm interested in terms of the work that I do because I've really had results with that. You know, like I had a client um, who was HIV positive who was working in an addiction center, and his HIV. Um, in a way, it's like HIV, it's like the disease is like, has a consciousness on its own. And it's yeah. almost like a, it's almost like a, um, how could you say it? It's like, a, it's almost like everything that's unresolved or unfinished or runs on an unconscious level somehow manifests in disease. Yeah. So if, if, in my work, if you allow someone to First of all, let the disease speak as if it was conscious and see what its message is. You know, on the whole, it's actually unbelievable how, what it says. You know, for each person, it's like the disease is trying to give you a message. If you don't change your lifestyle and if you don't change the choices that you make and what you, how you're acting and what you're thinking, it's going to take you out. So that's, in a way, that's like, you know, because my work focuses on, you know, embodying aspects of the system that somebody is either aware or unaware of. And so if their disease or the virus that they're carrying is a part of their system, it would obviously, if you could, if you could give it a voice, it would have a message. And on the whole, it does. And so people have to, you know, when they start to get well, it's because they start listening to what this what this virus message is. You know, if you don't change, you're going to die. And so people, if they if they listen and they start changing and they start doing what makes them happy and closer to that that um, natural frequency that you're talking about, then they they their CD4 count goes up and they start to get well and they they move into a different um, state essentially. And see, the, the the science backs that up uh, through and through because it, the the virus as a frequency is an information carrying medium and that information is involved in communication and what is the virus communicating? the message that there needs to be a change in lifestyle and attitude and belief system structure. So I, that, that's like, it's actually uh, uh, exactly what is going on. It's, it's very uh, appropriate. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, just tying it, tying it all in together. It's really fun to have the conversation. It, it's it's interesting how you know studying something so tiny and something so elusive, you know, like resonance and these frequencies, 
um, and that you know they work, you know they are behaving like quanta, you know, you know that they are non-local and transmitting, you know, <clears throat> in a non-physical way. And I think it's interesting, like with the work uh, that Amanda is doing with with the large, you know, with actual real physical cases in the big world, you know, and both fields of science, you know, have no instruments, you know, to prove how this is working. That you just know that the, by observing it, that this is how it's behaving, and it's producing results. And I, I just find it fascinating how it is through the experiences, you know, through the through the effects that the that you are studying this and you're seeing that something is happening cannot be explained. But it's real. It's there. It's it's through the experience that the, that it can be shown. Yeah, I mean, I think that the 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 leap that people are making at the moment is how can this invisible and tiny world that that you know we are creating all the time through our thinking and our perceptions and um, all those kind of things, our beliefs. It's all sitting in this invisible field around us coded with information um, based on whatever it is that we're thinking about and how that sits around us, around our bodies and you know, emanates from within us and is affecting us. And I think that the, the, the whole technology field of computers and cell phones and all of that is helping people to understand that even though something is invisible doesn't mean it's not there. Right. You know, and how to start to help people link thoughts to health and, um, you know, a lot of people, it's, it still seems to be a controversial thing to say to someone that, that they are creating on some level their disease or that, you know, that they can actually get well if they start to find out what is the consciousness or what is the message, what is the information inside this disease. It's really a controversial thing to say still and yet it's helping people it's it's just so, so different than what our, our historical paradigm especially within the medical establishment has espoused <laughs> you know it's uh it's 180 degrees different almost but you you know whereas in the uh kind of historical paradigm, you were the victim of a disease and <laughs> you needed, you know, a, an authority outside of yourself to come in and try to fix you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah, really. or that your genetics are fixed and you brought it in yeah. from your family line, that's another big one. Right. It's kind of it's it's uh, um, a victim-based belief system, in a way, which is a, a you know a method of disempowerment, really. Yeah, and in terms of your field with epigenetics, I mean, it couldn't be further from the truth that that the DNA is a blueprint, and that's you know you you're a victim of your genetics and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, th there has been some pretty interesting, actually, uh, developments in the uh, epigenetics actually linking information theory of cosmological physics with actually the molecular biology. Uh, it's been kind of Actually, pretty uh, some exciting breakthroughs recently on that front. Cosmological. Um. Uh, well, uh, cosmological uh, uh, um, physics or, or cosmological holography. You mean in terms of the frequencies coming from the universe? Oh uh, well, um, it, it, it's related to that, but it, uh, it's actually a part of. Um, information theory and uh, as it is now it's basically showing how all information in the universe 
is encoded onto two-dimensional surfaces, um, like a holographic membrane surface horizons. Um, they're probably not literally two-dimensional, because what does that mean physically? Uh, you, you know, I mean, as far as spatial dimensions go, uh, uh, it doesn't really make a lot of conceptual sense to talk about a two-dimensional structure in the universe, but... Well, that could can, be the dream board. <laughs> What's that? It could be the dream board, the vision board. That could be the two-dimensional structure. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, so, all information is thought to be encoded on these uh, uh, two-dimensional surfaces, uh, these kind of holographic membrane surface horizons, and they're called holographic because all the information is stored on these two-dimensional surfaces, but it projects out to create the physical universe almost in a like a three-dimensional hologram uh, because you know the, the hologram the holograph is just a, a two-dimensional structure with a wave interference pattern on it but when you shine light through it it creates a fully three-dimensional object and it's thought that actually the universe is exactly the same way. It's functioning like this, where um, almost all information is encoded like as a wave interference pattern on these two-dimensional surfaces. And when, say, the light of consciousness shines through it, it recreates a three-dimensional object. The, 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 in a sense, you know, this isn't an exact analogy. Uh, it's, it's a great, it's a great analogy um, in a way, even though I'm sort of playing with and stretching with the concepts a bit, but it is a great analogy in terms of how, you know, you could create a vision board or whatever or something that you want and then you focus your consciousness onto it and that creates this, this um, you know, essentially a three-dimensional reality Yes. You come just through your through your focus because it's your focus. You choose which one you want to create. <laughs> or experience. Or, or, your experience, yeah. Yeah, it's great. But this so here's the link though with molecular biology, with epigenetics. So not only is this how the universe is fundamentally encoding deciphering and transmitting information, but it's also how the biological system is doing it as a holofractal graphic representation of the universe as a whole. And that you take the DNA molecule and the present theory or paradigm is that all of the information is coded inside of it almost in the three-dimensional space within it in the nucleotide sequence that it's coded in there and that it's fixed and there's nothing you can do about it although there, there's no molecular biology geneticist that thinks that really anymore i mean epigenetics is pretty strongly well established but what is more likely the case scenario is that the information is actually coded on the outside on the two-dimensional surface horizon of the backbone of the DNA molecule itself. And there's a lot of reasons and observations that have been made that support this and show that it's very likely actually the case. But here's the thing is, so if all the information is actually encoded on the surface horizon, on the two-dimensional surface of the DNA molecule, um, that is where epigenetic 
uh, alterations or changes are being made uh, through that's the molecular mechanism by which it's affected is that um, molecules will be added to that surface that, that um, kind of thinking of it as a two-dimensional surface of the DNA molecule it will be added to the outside of that added onto it and that is what changes the information content and so um, it's another way in which we can um, directly, because the, the way that those epigenetic alterations are made is through going back once again to our thoughts, emotions, and overall uh, a frequency. Right, right. Um, you know, this has been shown experimentally as well. Uh, so, you know, it's a, 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 another link. Uh, kind of tying it all together. And that's and where the theater, you know, the, 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 the concept of the theater and the application of drama therapy and, and this, this constellations therapy as well is so useful because you've got this a stage of life as a metaphor and you can get people to visit various timelines in the space and you can say to them well what do you want to experience and you can allocate a space in the room that represents that holographic reality and they can sit in it and then you say to them okay well you are it now and I'm going to interview you from that reality and you're going to answer me as if you are it and it gives them the opportunity to essentially create that hologram in consciousness which would, you know, create the frequency that would activate those um, uh, epigenetic propensities or whatever, whatever. And they would start having that information flowing to them from that time and space. Yeah. Is that a stretch or is that what you were saying at all? Or? Yeah, so in other words, yeah, if you absolutely. set up the perception and that person can enter into it and be it yeah. in the now and you can, they're, they're accessing a timeline, then they, they, they're sending out a signal from the perception of that time and, and place into the DNA. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, it's um, the efficacy of what you're saying is hundred percent because you're saying to be it you, you know to actually you know embody that right and, and the reason why that's so important you know more important than just thinking about it or wishing for it or <laughs> believing it's true is that when you are it you're embodying it it's in your body and it's making the physical changes especially epigenetically that cause it, that, that make it so, that make it true. So is, isn't the body, isn't, isn't the body then a huge uh, resonance machine and that the, the thought that we embody is, uh, is the one driving, you know, the, the resonance that we are uh, being. Is, is that how it works? That's, that's exactly right. It, it's, it's, um, it, it's just like I mean, you can, you know, bring it to, like, um, a, a good analogy, kind of a simple one, uh, is, you know, with our earliest resonant technologies, such as, like, uh, our radios, you know, uh, the, the way that they worked is that um, they would receive frequencies, electromagnetic frequencies, uh, those would be transmitted as electrical currents to a crystal, a quartz crystal. Now quartz crystal would vibrate uh, from those at a very specific resonant frequency. The, the, the frequencies being received would make the quartz crystal vibrate 
at a very specific rate, which would become its signature frequency at that point, and it, uh, that would subsequently those physical vibrations of the crystal cause it to emit electric impulses transmit out uh, the signature electromagnetic frequency of that vibration. But that is almost exactly how the body is working as well. It's receiving these frequencies um, vibrating at a, 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 a you know, a, a signature harmonic oscillation, uh, a signature resonance. And that signature creates its own perceptions, right? That essentially uh, the signal coming from our thoughts gets relayed and decoded through our perceptions and then sent into the body according to that. And, and also, w what you're tuning into literally depends on what channel you're tuning to. <laughs> right. right. So, so tuning the body uh, uh, for what experience you're going to have. Yeah. Exciting. This is fascinating. Fascinating yeah. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's so yeah. much more to say, but I can see that we're at an hour now. And so maybe we should, um, maybe we should bring it to an end and then maybe, you know, in a couple of weeks or months or something, we can have another discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that that would be wonderful, and I, I can I can see how we could even uh, you know prepare a, an interview, uh, a printed interview for the magazine out of these conversations. You know, I can see how I could work on that. That that would be awesome. Oh, that would be amazing. Oh, that's very exciting. <laughs> I know, and there's just there's so much to say. I mean, William, you were saying also about how the dolphins. Um, are helping with their their frequency and their sounds to reprogram the genes to create a new species which is going on on earth at the moment that's also yeah so um you know i just had the opportunity to um actually directly interact with the dolphins out there in hawaii uh one of the researchers here at the uh, foundation, his name is uh, Dr. Michael Heisen. Uh, he also runs the Sirius Institute uh, in, in Kona on the Big Island. Uh, and the Sirius Institute is involved in uh, human dolphin relationships, uh, research into the, the interconnections between humans and dolphins, etc. Um, and uh, w one of the amazing things about dolphins, kind of uh, like a physical, an actual physical mechanism on which this is being directly done, is they have an anatomical structure called the melon, and it sits at the um, kind of at their forehead area, right in front of the brain. The, the prefrontal uh, uh, cortex, and it's this huge uh, piezoelectric membrane, just like that quartz crystal I was just talking about in the uh, uh, radio. And, and the, the, most of the, the paracrystalline structures in our body are piezoelectric. Um, so they, they receive uh, um, electrical signals from electromagnetic frequencies and they vibrate in response to that and their physical vibrations is a phonon like, like sound actually produce um, electrical signals and electromagnetic frequencies in response to that well so these dolphins actually have this down to a science, so to speak, and that they can use those electromagnetic transmissions from this organ uh, to actually affect the molecular and physical structures in our body directly, uh, uh, consciously. 
they can do this. Uh, so I, it, it's possible that, that this hasn't been shown experimentally, although I'd love to at some point set this up and show it, but it's very possible that they are able to directly affect the epigenetic landscape uh, through this mechanism uh, to consciously do it. It's a possibility. It, it, hasn't, it, it hasn't been shown yet. Again, there's circumstantial evidence from the Sirius Institute that, that uh, shows that this could be the case. But um, Dr. Michael Heisen, he's even seen these dolphins be able to uh, boil water like in front of them, they can cause a frequency shift that is so great that it actually causes uh, uh, water to boil in front of them at a specific location. They can paralyze fish with it, so they use it for hunting oftentimes, uh, as well as probably uh, uh, interspecies or, or, or uh, um, interspecies communication. Uh, through a uh, uh, sonar, as well as this uh, uh, phonon to electric uh, uh, effect as well. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's so much that can, can be said about that, actually. It's very interesting. I know. Wow, that's there's, fascinating. There's a whole another interview around sound and um, resonance and reprogramming. Just, uh, just, just one other thing about that, just real quick. It, I think is just really fascinating is that in a comparison of the human and dolphin genomes, uh, it was found that this was done by uh, uh, veterinarians at Texas A&M University. Uh, when, when they did a comparison of the genomes, it was found that the dolphin genome actually is identical. <laughs> Uh, uh, as far as the sequences go, when they did a sequence comparison, the dolphins have all the same sequences of DNA that we have. They've just been rearranged, so they're I I expressing a different order. But uh, we essentially have the same genome, which is very uh, another very interesting aspect. Very about, interesting. Yeah, yeah. What's, what, what could be going on? <laughs> So, um, Jaime, I don't know. I think we probably that's probably enough for one for one. Yes, I, I think so. Yeah, before we move into a whole different field, I, I, know, I think that was a, this was a great whole realm we could go into. But let's leave that for another time. Yeah, yeah, but this is this is all really fascinating. It's really great, and uh, I'm very pleased to meet you, uh, William. And look forward to talking with you uh, again some more. Thank you, Jaime. Uh, it's been really great. I'll talk with you and uh, really, really good to meet you. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm hoping to bring William out here in June or July. So um, we look forward to actually sitting around the table together and chatting. That sounds great. I, I wrote the, the link there to our magazine if you, you're interested. You have a little time to check it later on. Great. Great. Thank you. Sounds, sounds good, Amanda. Thank you so much for inviting me, and uh, I look forward to, to speaking with you guys again. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Jaime. Thanks, William. Thank you. Goodbye, you guys. Have Bye. Aloha. Aloha. Bye. Aloha.